Because I said to him, when you were like in Greek Orthodox, because that's what he was growing up, mm. I said, did you guys have Sunday school? He said, I don't think so. No. No. And then I said, well, so how'd you learn anything? And I guess it's maybe what your parents teach you. And then he went to DePaul, a Catholic deaf school, and they said, you had religion class, right? I know right. they had to. He goes, yeah. I said, he goes, but I never heard that story about a deaf person in the DePaul school. Yeah, of all is of all things. I don't know. For those uh, online, this is our first session uh, for our discipleship class, and just a little background about that. One of our our uh, one of our folks attending today is deaf, and we just did a lesson today about a deaf uh, mute person, and uh, so this is a new story to you, right? I'm going to be very deliberate, more deliberate in my speech, so that you can understand me. So those online, deal with it. <laughs> this is the way we're going to do this. We accommodate each other. Okay. And you are going to tell me, go like this. So let's make a motion that lets me know that you did not understand. Oh, sorry, hand, up. hand up. Okay, good. And then I'll slow down and I'll come back and revisit that. So, uh, Discipleship 201, we have multiple different classes in this church to help people know a little bit better what it means, first of all, to be a Christian, a disciple of Christ, and then a leader within the church. So, you have gotten a background about what it means to be a Christian in your churches. I have great confidence whether you are from a Roman Catholic Church, an Orthodox Church, um, we've had other folks from Baptist churches, from Pentecostal churches, we all preach the same Jesus, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have any bigotry towards people who are Roman Catholic or Orthodox or of any denomination or Assemblies of God. We are all Christian. We do have some differences on some of the doctrinal issues, but none of them are important for salvation. If you believe in Jesus, that's what it means to be a Christian. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So this class assumes that you have a relationship with Christ, you want to know what it means to be a disciple of Christ within the context of this Lutheran church. Okay, so the very first thing we get to, if you open up your booklet, session one is confessing our brokenness. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because we want to try to get to two lessons every day. So I might shortchange some of these. But look at the gospel here. The devil led Jesus up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give the glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone whom I please. If you will then just worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord and serve only him. So our perspective that is not different than a Roman Catholic or a Baptist or whatever, we will never grow in our faith until we admit that we are sinful and cannot reach God by our own good works or by our own willpower. Sin is that partition that is created that keeps our faith from growing. But I want to remind you that it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. You have a relationship with God, okay? God loves you no matter what. We grow in our relationship with God and the security that God is not going to turn his back on us. So I want you to think of it like our children. Our children might do some things that are wrong, but we don't turn our backs on them. We still love them. We still have a relationship with them. And we hope that they grow in their relationship. At some point, we hope when our kids are 30 
or 35 years of age, they turn to us and say, Mom and Dad, I can't believe everything that you did for me. And I want to thank you for that. Okay? This is what confession and forgiveness is all about. It doesn't earn us the kingdom of heaven. We don't go to heaven because we confessed our sins. We are saved by grace. And because of that, we want to grow our relationship with God. And so what keeps us from going our relationship with God is sin. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, we have to look at what sin is. It is something that we all are. We are made in God's image according to Genesis chapter 1. So you're beautiful in God's sight, but something happened that distorted, distorted our image that makes us sinful. We were <clears throat> created without sin, and so we can't excuse our sin by saying, well, you know, I'm only human after all. Well, that's not a justification for doing hurtful things to other people. You can be human, but that doesn't mean that you're sinful. So where does this all begin? Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. You've heard that story, correct? Adam and Eve... Uh, desired to be like God. They then would not have to answer to anyone. They no longer have to be obedient creatures of God. They have what's called the two-year-old disease. I remember when my daughter Carissa was two years old. Hey, Johnny. Hello, Janice. Pastor. We're doing our discipleship class now before we get to things here. So be patient. So sit down, be patient, but good to have, see you. I have something for you. Okay, well, John, I'll see you afterwards. After I have something for you, too, but I can't find it in the move. I got crazy stuff. Nice to see you guys. All right. So let's go on with this. So Adam and Eve, they desired to be like God, but they have what we call a, what I used to look at as what I call the two-year-old disease, which is, I can do it all by myself-ism. Well, that's kind of silly. We know that two-year-olds can't do it all by themselves, can they? Uh, the problem is they rebelled against God by wanting to be their own gods, right? Now, where do we see that in life? We're very prideful people, aren't we? We don't like to be told what to do. We like to be our own boss, right? That gets us into trouble because we're made to be in relationship with each other and ultimately with God. So, I'm going to skip a few things, go down to number three. The results of this rebellion against God, we're told, leads to physical death. God says, or Paul says, just as sin came into the world through one man, so death came through sin. It leads to broken relationship with God. It leads to a life where we live in shame. Some people live their life always, oh, I'm so awful, I'm so awful. That's not what our attitude should be. We sin, but you're still a beautiful creation of God. So we shouldn't think that badly of ourselves. It also leads to blaming others. That's what happened in Genesis 1. When Adam was confronted with eating of the fruit, what does he do? Blames Eve. What does Eve do? Blames a snake. Okay? We need to take responsibility for our own crap. Okay? we got to stop blaming each other. It leads to a perverted conscience. We ultimately become slaves to this sin. And so there's no middle ground, Paul tells us. We're either slaves to Satan or slaves to Christ. And so the question of today's lesson is, whose slave are you willing to be? Of a God who loves you and adores you or a saint who doesn't care about you at all? Right? So this is why God calls us to repent. So let me tell you how sin works in our life. Because we are so used to thinking of sin as the big ticket items. Thou shalt not kill. Okay, how many people have killed somebody today? Not in the last yet. month? Not yet. Last year? Not yet. <laughs> Been close. Hasn't happened. So that's a big ticket item. How many of us stolen? 
Well, when I was younger, I stole a few things, you know. Yeah, there you go. So we've done some of those big ticket items. But let me tell you what a sin is. I'm going to tell you a sin. 20 years ago, my wife came to me after a very difficult day of working at McDonald's and wanted to talk. She was just very upset about some of her employees. I have the pirate game on. Okay, I'm listening to the pirate game. She wants to talk and she starts to talk and she looks over at the radio and I realize that she wants me to f my full attention. So guess what I do because I'm a loving husband. I turn the radio uh, down, uh, <laughs> but not off. Now, my wife knows something about me, and that is simply that I can only do one thing at one time. <laughs> okay? If that radio is on, the ball game is on, guess who is not getting my attention? My wife is not getting my attention. So I'm going to tell you that's a sin. I sinned against my wife. It's called adultery. We think of adultery as just a physical, um, sexual unfaithfulness to one's spouse. But I was committing adultery against my wife for a stupid baseball game. Because that baseball game was more important than my relationship with my wife. I broke my relationship with my wife. Okay? Now... That's kind of disconcerting to people. What? Sin is anything that breaks my relationship with you, where I've intentionally or even unintentionally harmed you in some way, and it causes a rift in our relationship. That's sin. <coughs> okay, I'm timing out because we're trying to make sure this is understood. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Understand? Okay, inside thing here, all right. Fantastic. So what do we do when I hurt you? So when I hurt you, I not only hurt you, I hurt the one who created us, don't I? So I do something selfish or greedy or hurtful to you. I also hurt you. So I hurt you, I hurt him. I not only hurt you, I hurt God because God loves you too. I've got all these broken relationships, don't I? Because of that lack of consideration. So this is what creates a barrier between us and our relationship. That's why we come to repentance. Repentance, again, doesn't earn us. This is on, the next, I think, the next page where there's that little drawing. God calls us to repentance, and repentance does not earn us forgiveness. Forgiveness is the free gift of God. Sin prevents us from receiving this gift, and so repentance allows us to access the gift of God's forgiveness fully. And so you can see my little drawings there. There's nothing that you can do that can earn God's love. But we repent to acknowledge that we have created this barrier that separates us from God and from each other. Um, so if I were to, let me use another example, because I'm going to skip some of this. So this is, I'm going to include both of you, okay? If I were to hurt you in some way, intentionally, I come and take my, I don't know, I take my key and run it across your car because I'm mad at you. I don't know, for whatever reason. Here comes that kill today. Yeah. Okay, now you might kill for the first time. Okay. I hurt you. I break my relationship with you. Right? But again, not just you. I hurt you because this is your wife. You're upset because she's upset. You care about the things that she cares about. But not just you. God. And anybody who loves you, I've hurt. So, what if I were to come up to you and say, Hey, all right, I'm going to repair the damage. I'll go repair that panel. We're okay right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why? 
but I just repaired your car. Okay, I'll give you $1,000 on top of that. Are we okay? There's something else that's broken. It's not about the money. It should, that should be, I should take care of the damage I've done. But what's really been broken here is relationship. You no longer trust me. Okay, now here's the key. How is our relationship ever going to get better? If I were to come and say, I'm sorry, are we okay now? Guess what? You have to forgive me, don't you? So isn't it interesting how I hurt you, but now... The power is over in your court right now. You can either forgive me or not. I should fix the damage that I've done. I should apologize to acknowledge to you that I understand I hurt you. But ultimately, you're the one that must forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. But then I also have God. And God, but God's forgiveness is a given. But I do need to repent to acknowledge to you that I understand how I've hurt you. Because otherwise... So this hurt goes two ways. Hurt, you're really hurt. Yeah, mine was just stupid. Right? What I did to you was dumb. Your hurt is understandable. Okay? But that's why we need confession and forgiveness so that we can remove these barriers. I will tell you, on my moving into the house that I moved into, oh, my movers did something that I told them not to do. We have a piano, and they were looking at our stairs. How do we get this up? They, they were said they could do it, and then they looked at our stairs, and they said, I'm not sure we can do it. I said, take the piano back home to the parsonage. That's fine. They said, no, we're going to get it up there. We think we can get it up by taking up the neighbor's driveway. I said, you can't take it up our neighbor's driveway until you ask them for permission. So I went and I knocked on the door. They didn't answer. We know they were home, but they refused to answer the door. That's their choice. They don't have to. I knocked three. I went back. They said, somebody's looking. I went back, knocked again. I said, they took the piano out. I said, do not do this until we get permission you might need to put it back on there if we don't get permission from them. Okay? Did they know who they were dealing with? <laughs> well, this is our next door neighbor. No, I know that. No, I, I know, I know with me. And then finally I said, look, I'm going to go around the back of the house to see if they're in the backyard and see if I can't get their attention. I went back to the back of the house. I came back. It was already up the driveway. They were looking for me to leave to take it up the driveway. I said, you do realize you just created a situation between me and my neighbor. And it did create a two-week strain between me and my... They, they actually left a very nasty letter. How dare you give your movers permission to do this? I'm like, I didn't give them permission to do that. I told them specifically not to. But I had to go and repent to them. I went to them and said, I'm very sorry for this. I hope you will forgive me for this. Because I want a relationship with you. This is not the type of neighbor I am. I understand that your private, personal space was intruded upon. And that's what was so hurtful. And you need to know that that's not the type of neighbor I am. And I hope you'll forgive me. Well, they have. We're okay. Touch him. Yeah. He's such a nice man. Yeah, and glorious. But I, don't, I told him, I don't blame you for being upset. It's understandable. Okay, we violated their space. But that's why confession and forgiveness is such an important part of the Christian life. Not because it earns us a place in God's kingdom. Not because we then magically go to heaven. You don't get to heaven by repenting. You restore relationships by repentance. Okay? So, oh, that's my brief version of chapter 1. Let me stop and ask if there are any questions about what, why we do confession and forgiveness as a part of our church. We're trying to teach you how to reconcile relationships. So for me, it's just different because you do this every Sunday. Right. 
you know, and for us, it was, you had to make a special... Go to the priest. Yeah. Right. And then you had to, like, do penance. Mm -hmm. Not so much tell the person that you hurt. How does that help a person that you hurt? They have no idea. <laughs> right? This is all, we are concerned about making sure it's in the context of relationships. Yeah. And that's what I want. And so this is our opportunity again. Me giving you 20 Hail Marys to say, or this or that, or whatever, acts of penance to do, don't help, doesn't help anything. It's just about relationships. In fact, I can say my mom to me one time said, and that's like when she just kind of dropped out of stuff with yeah. my church. And she said, well, that priest told me what to do. She's like, does he have any idea how hard it is to be a mother? And you want me to do something? Right. Like, it, may, it didn't balance in her life at all. No, it, yeah, it I hear you. It didn't put anything to help anything be better. So, um, yeah, I like that. I like the concept. <laughs> there you go. So we wanted to make sure you understand that that's why we do repentance. It's to teach you. And if you notice... Uh, I don't have my book in front of you. The, the, the announcement of forgiveness is about being, you know, about our relationship with God and how we're now also to reconcile with one another. Okay? You need to hear this. And the reason why you need to hear this, is this goes with now chapter 2. So turn over to chapter 2. Because if we don't participate in this confession of forgiveness to reconcile relationships we will continue to hold on to the hurts of life and they will destroy us, okay? And I, if you've ever had a relationship that's unreconciled and you just sit there and wonder, oh, I wish I could go call that person, I wish I could, but you have an unreconciled relationship and sometimes 10, 15, 20 years go uh, between you and that person, you never talk, and the more time uh, built between you and that relationship, the less likely that relationship will ever be reconciled. So my take is, in fact, I went to Jack. You talk about Jack. What did I do? I went up and I said, look, I need to, you know, we kind of reconciled. I said, I, just the other day, I said, I want to make sure we are okay. Because I know you've been hurt, and but I really want this relationship with you, and I want to make sure you folks have forgiven us. And, because that's a direct question you have to ask. You can't just say, I'm sorry. You have to say, will you forgive me? Okay. Right? That's a risk. It's, e it, it's easier to just say, I'm sorry. But you, 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 people will say, I'm sorry, just because they want something to go away. It's a very cynical thing. Have you ever seen somebody apologize that way? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry. You should be forgiving me right now. Well, that person is not dealing with how hurtful this was to that person. I'm sorry, I hope you will forgive me. So what happens if this other person that's been offended doesn't accept? Good question. That's part of what this lesson is about. But I'm going to, uh, we only have, we have like 10 minutes, so I'm going to try to, that's why we're kind of transitioning to releasing our hurts and forgiving others. Because now you have sometimes been hurt, or sometimes people refuse to forgive you. All we can do in terms of that latter one is do the best that we can. can. If, I, if you refuse to forgive me for scratching your, I, you know, uh, your car door, I've at least asked for forgiveness and said, will you forgive me? He said, no, I can't. I'm here. And I'm, I'm willing to listen. I understand you're upset, and I might just have to walk away. Sometimes there are relationships right. that cannot be reconciled. Okay. And you can't do anything about that because you've been the perpetrator, right? But on the other side, put yourself in the other person's shoes now. You have now been hurt. We've all been hurt at some point by somebody, by our kids, by our neighbors, by our parents, by your oh. pastors, okay? <laughs> we are. So what do we do when that ha happens? Jesus says, Matthew 6, forgive us our debts as we for, for, have for also forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us to that time of trial. Hi, come on in. But rescue us from evil. We're just finishing up a class here, and then we'll be starting worship in just a bit. So for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Doesn't it sound like God's forgiveness is contingent upon us forgiving others? 
I don't think that's exactly what Jesus means. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit in the lesson. But the question is, is why should we forgive? Jesus is, remember, telling this to his disciples. And he's saying, you know what it's like to be forgiven. Therefore, you should forgive. God has forgiven you this much. And this person has done this much to you, and you aren't willing to forgive them? Are you kidding me? That's what this part of the prayer is about. After everything I've forgiven you, and you can't forgive somebody who's hurt you that much. Come on. So that's the point of this. So why should we forgive? Because again, God forgives us first. Second, because God commands us to forgive others as he forgives. That's a sign of a person who's redeemed by Christ. Three, those who hold on to unforgiveness will ultimately be held accountable. You've been forgiven. Why do you continue to refuse forgiveness to somebody? And ultimately, an unforgiving heart, this is the one I want to get to, poisons your heart. If you refuse to forgive people, I know the most bitter people I know, all they do is they rehearse the wounds that have been perpetrated against them. They're always a victim. Everybody's out to get them. Oh, poor me. Boy, we have political candidates like that, right? They're always rehearsing how they've been hurt and wronged and wounded and blah, blah, blah. Give it up. Let it go, for goodness sakes, right? When all you do is rehearse how everybody's wronged you, hurt you, done you wrong, you, be, you produce this bitterness in your life. You become a bitter person. Nobody wants to be around you, right? Bitterness is not natural. It's something you nurture by hurt, rehearsing, harboring resentments, rehearsing those hurts, justifying why you shouldn't forgive the people who've hurt you. Unforgiveness. And also those negative judgmental thoughts. Bitterness ultimately destroys a person's life. And I am telling you there are physical effects to bitterness, right? There are social effects. It alienates you from other people. There are emotional effects. It causes you to be depressed. People who are, who are unforgiving people are more depressed uh, than people who are not. It leads to spiritual alienation from God and from each other. It poisons those around us. If you are unforgiving in your spirit, it poisons your children. It poisons your relationship with your spouse. It poisons your relationship with your friends. And what we tend to do when we are angry like this and bitter, we take our bitterness out on somebody closest to us. Because that other person has gone on with their life and they don't care. Right? Sometimes you won't get a reconciled relationship. They're going on. They don't care what they did to you. They're going on. You know, my, my daughter, you know, as you may not know this, maybe. I think we, talked, we have talked about this. In 2018, five boys beat the living crap out of her. Those kids don't know that she's suffered for the last five or six years terribly because of that. They don't care. Okay. I could go on with my life. I, you know, we had to real quick come to some terms with that and say we could be bitter the rest of her life about the fact that her whole, her whole life is now derailed because of this. But we can't allow that to happen. Right? We have to find a way to overcome that. We'll never get to talk to those kids. Yeah, I'd still like to strangle those kids. But they don't care. So somehow I have to release this bitterness so that she can live and we can live and still see hope in our future. So um, how can we overcome an unforgiving spirit? Okay? How can, we, how can we do that? And that's we'll finish with this. Time is never going to heal all of our wounds, does it? <clears throat> we need to do something constructive with the bitterness and the anger in our life. We already talked about confessing, but here's what I'm telling to you. If somebody's hurt you badly and you're giving into bitterness, you still need to confess your bitterness. God, I'm allowing this to destroy me. Um... So it's like the scales of justice and all. Yeah, yeah. And here's the crazy thing. Sometimes you need to confess your bitterness to the person with whom you're bitter. Because that might actually be the door that opens up a reconciled relationship. 
I've been very bitter with people at times, and finally I said, it's my problem. Yeah, they hurt me. They did everything they needed to to forgive, to seek forgiveness, but I'm still holding it against them. Who's the problem here? I am. Okay? So, in those cases, I, we need to ask for forgiveness. Of that person against whom we hold this bitterness. But you never use that as an opportunity to slam them and say, well, you know, but what you did to me was wrong. Wait a minute, they've already apologized, right? I can't use that as an opportunity to hit them again. I'm wrong because I'm contributing to this broken relationship. All right? We need to seek help from others. That's what the church is here for. That's why we exist as a church, to help each other through these times of bitterness so that we have others with whom we pray. Do something constructive with your anger. What's her name? Um, why can't I think of her name? She's on one of the daytime TV shows, uh, early morning TV shows, and she's no longer on it. I, I can't even think of the person that's on it right now in her place. But at any rate, she, she at one time, she said whenever people would say very hurtful things about her, one of the things that she would do is she would write a check to that person's favorite charity and send that check in that person's name. <laughs> and they would get a thank you letter. Oh, well, we received a donation in your name to such and such a charity from this person. That was her way of dealing with an anger and bitterness. For her, it worked. And it was her way of connecting with this person, I guess. So we seek help from others. We do construct something constructive with our anger. We fill our life with godly thoughts. And then here's the thing. We pray for our enemies. That God will strike them dead, right? No. Wrong way. <laughs> Wrong way. We pray for enemies. We pray for God to bless them. And to change our attitudes towards them. If our prayer for enemies is that God will get them, you don't understand the gospel. We need to rehearse forgiveness. How do we restore relationship, not our hurts? Now, let me end with this. There are, as you indicated, certain, as we talked about earlier, certain relationships that cannot and will not be reconciled. Forgiveness does not mean allowing somebody to run, ramp, run over you. I grew up in a very abusive household. My stepfather beat the living crap out of me many times. Uh, I've been thrown through plate glass windows. I've been beaten unconscious by him. Okay, can I release that and so I'm not a bitter person? Yes. However, I'm not going to allow him. I did when he was alive. I refused to allow him to do the same thing to my daughter. Okay. It is okay to draw boundaries around yourself. You can forgive somebody and let it go, but not allow them to hurt you anymore. Because there are some people that you can forgive and let go, but they haven't changed because of it. So then you need to draw those boundaries around them and say, you're not going to hurt me in this way anymore. And that's okay. All right, and I say that in particular to abused women. Because abused women, uh, when I've done some count, have it, have it, have it, abuse people in general, but women tend to be uh, on that receiving end quite viciously, oftentimes physical in, in particular. They tend to go back to this person. You're like, why would you do that? And then they do it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I forgive because that's what I do as a godly woman. No, that's not what you're supposed to do. If that man has broken that relationship with you, right, what do you do? You say, you're not getting that opportunity to do that again. No. That's not going to happen. It is okay to say no. Okay? But somehow we need to overcome that bitterness in life so that it doesn't consume us. So it's a difficult balance, and that's why we're here as a church, to help each other forgive and to be forgiven and walk in that forgiveness and relationship. Any questions that you folks have? For those that are going to be at home, those who are not here today for this, class. Uh, I hope uh, this is beneficial. If you have any questions, let me know. We will be back next week for our se next session. Send them a prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for these lessons about forgiveness and lessons about bitterness and about relationships. We pray that you would bless us this day, that we might 
First of all, understand we are forgiven. And in that forgiveness and your love for us, help us to forgive others and release those, that bitterness and that hurt in our life that would destroy our relationship with those around us. For this is what the purpose of our faith is, to restore relationship with you and one another. If we thank you for this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, amen. blessings to you guys. Right. Get out of here. <laughs> I got to get with these guys now. I'm a little right. bit late. So for our worship, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you okay with me being late?